build your own Big Orange Video Library. See highlights from the thrilling 1985 SEC championship season and the magical Sugar Bowl victory over Miami. Or the highlights from the Vols 89-11-1 SEC championship season and 1990 Cotton Bowl victory. Get these and other videos from UTV Home Video. Call toll free 1-800-729-7043 and order today. When the University of Tennessee entered college football in 1891, the Knoxville Journal reported that the game of football is beginning to obtain a foothold here. We were there when it all began. We were there when the Vols first beat Alabama. We were there when General Bob Nealon led UT to a national championship. We were there in New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl victory over Miami, and we were in Dallas for the Cotton Bowl victory this year. The Journal has been there every step with UT football for 100 years, and we plan to be around for the next 100. We hope you'll be along too as we bring you volunteer football the way it should be. Maybe that's one of the reasons the Associated Press gave us a first place national award last year for best daily sports section. Legendary New Sentinel sports writer Tom Seiler had a love for Tennessee football. His columns describe the building of one of our nation's top college sports programs. In over 30 years of coverage, Tom stressed fairness and integrity. As the university celebrates 100 years of football, the new Sentinel's award-winning staff carries on Tom Seiler's tradition. John Adams, twice named Tennessee Sports Columnist of the Year, and an award-winning staff are ready to provide news of the latest UT football legends. The new Sentinel salutes the university's celebration of 100 years of volunteers. We promise to continue the tradition of complete coverage as we help kick off the next 100 years. The team that makes the fewest mistakes wins, and that's number one. The general had an influence on all of us, and he was great. It probably was the most exciting run I ever saw. This is rugby, a very rough game that was developed in Europe and is still being played today, even on the UT campus. From rugby, we get the roots of our modern day football. Princeton and Rutgers got the whole thing going in the United States as their game in 1869 was the first collegiate contest. Football quickly became a hit up north. But many of the hits that came with the sport brought debilitating injuries and even death in some instances. But even with its risks, fans simply loved the action, and Tennessee was ready to field a team by 1891. For that year, there was only to be a game in Chattanooga with Sewanee. As expected, it was a cakewalk, but for the Tigers, not Tennessee. The 24 to nothing setback did nothing to dampen UT fan enthusiasm, which grew by leaps and bounds in 1896 and 97, when there was only one Tennessee loss. A key player in those two seasons was 1897 team captain Strang Nicklin. Nicklin later was to become baseball coach at West Point, where he tutored a young player by the name of Robert Nealon. Maybe you've heard of him. Very few good things come out of war. But the Spanish-American War prompted the university to take the state's nickname as its own. As usual, more Tennesseans volunteered to serve in this late 19th century conflict than were expected. 
and UT teams would officially come to be known as the Volunteers by 1905. J.A. Pierce had become UT's first paid coach in 1899 and was succeeded by four more men before George Levine arrived in 1907. Levine guided Tennessee to back-to-back seven-win campaigns in his first two seasons, getting a great deal of help from a talented guard from Beaver Creek, Tennessee. His name was Nathan Dougherty, and he would later be entrenched as the University of Tennessee's Dean of the Engineering College, Chairman of its Athletic Council, and even served in official capacities with the NCAA, the Old Southern Conference, and the Southeastern Conference. Dougherty's extensive involvement with UT football would cover well over half a century. He, he, he scared me uh, as a student. I, I sort of kept my distance from him. And he was still uh, faculty chairman of athletic when I was appointed to the athletic board in 1951. So I had some personal experiences with him in an official capacity for several years. I don't have a present recollection of exactly when he retired but I remember my association with him. And I remember one thing he said to me at one time, and this is jumping the gun pretty fast, but he said that he always thought that the man who would or should replace Neil would be what he called Boudin. Why? That was no place The 1907 season was also significant in the fact that Tennessee finally got a permanent home field. After playing its home dates at several East Knoxville locations, the university secured the land at 15th and Cumberland to construct Waite Field. Bleachers were put in the following year, and by 1914, they were packed. Expectations were high for the 14 season as the Knoxville Journal Tribune declared, if the Tennessee team does not make a good showing this year, it is doubtful that it ever will. Now that's pressure. But fourth-year coach Zora Clevenger had built a powerful team. Players like Russ Lindsay, Bill May, and Goat Carroll led the Vols to easy victories in their first four games. Next came Alabama and its talented quarterback, Charles Joplin. But Joplin would not be available on this day, as Vol fans had helped turn him into the league for playing minor league baseball in Harriman the preceding summer. So Joplin set as UT turned back the tide 17 to 7, setting off a wild celebration throughout the city. All chatter turned to the Vanderbilt game and UT's hope for not only its first victory over the Commodores, but also its first SIAA title. Vol fans who couldn't gain a spot in one of the many trains that made the trek to Nashville waited impatiently for the results via telegraph at Knoxville's Grand Theater. It was easily the biggest game in Tennessee football history, and the script worked perfectly, as UT won a barn burner 16 to 14. For three full days, Knoxville went berserk, as everything in town, including the university, closed its doors. Tennessee finished at 9 and 0, and won that SIAA title. But those two feats don't bear out the significance of this team. UT football excitement came to the forefront in 1914, and it has not changed since. Clevenger departed a year later and was replaced with John Bender. Bender's five years at Tennessee were marred by two seasons of football inactivity due to World War I, and his leaving after the 1920 season was not unexpected, except for the fact that he left UT for a job at Knoxville High School. Dougherty was now running Tennessee's athletic department, and he hired former Drake coach M.B. Banks to guide the ball gritters. Banks was greeted with a new field in 1921, the gift of Colonel W.S. Shields. Shields stipulated that the field, which occupied the land behind Estabrook Hall, had to be built within a year. No one complained, as male students labored long and hard under the watchful eye of their female counterparts. This added motivation had the playing surface ready for the 21 season opener with Emory and Henry, which was a smashing success. Shields Watkins Field, named for Shields and his wife Alice Watkins Shields, was the site of a 27 0 triumph that day, and the place where Tennessee fans got their first look at UT's now famous orange jerseys a year later. Orange had been the school color for over 20 years, 
as the orange and white American daisy grew wildly on the hill. Many college teams had switched from black jerseys to those of their school colors. And to the pleasure of all fans who had wanted UT to do the same, Banks made the move. The fashion statement provided motivation that day as the Vols crushed Emory and Henry once again, this time by a 50 to nothing margin. For Banks, these were high moments as some fine campaigns were being marred by crushing losses to arch rival Vanderbilt. By 1925, his job was on the line and a 34 to seven loss to the Commodores had sealed his fate. Dougherty was going to make a move and he looked to a man who had led Tennessee to a stunning upset of Georgia that season while pinch hitting for the sickly banks. He was Captain Robert Nealon, and Dougherty hired him with explicit instructions, even the score with Vanderbilt. That would be a task as the Commodores had taken 16 of their first 19 meetings with the Vols. But Nealon was unafraid as he saw the potential to turn the program into a national powerhouse. It would not be long before the young captain got the volunteers to his destination. But ball fans were real interested to know who was Robert Nealon. At age 34, Nealon was a true Renaissance man. At West Point, the Texan had played both football and baseball, plus he was the school's boxing champion. Not only was he a soldier and an athlete, he was an engineer who studied at Texas A&M and MIT. Engineering technology gave him the ability to help lay the foundation for the work TVA would do during the Depression and to actually design the still functional plan for the stadium that now bears his name. Other Neyland innovations, the tearaway jersey, and even the phone that keeps the coaches in the press box in touch with the sideline. Neyland's coaching was systematic, with repetition to the point that after 40 years, players can still recite his game maxims. The team that makes the fewest mistakes wins. And that's number one. Number two, play for and make the breaks when one comes your way score. Number three, press the kicking game. It is here the breaks are made. Number four, if at first a game or break goes against you, don't slow down or get rattled, put on more steam. Number five, line and backs protect your kiss, kicker and passer. Line and ends rush their kicker and passer. Number six, Alabama, Oscar Wow Wow pursue. Here is a winning edge. Number seven, Carry the fight to Alabama and keep it there all after me. You never forget him. Nealon players claimed that they executed without flaw. Not so much due to great coaching, but from great teaching from the coaches. Tennessee players left Nealon as true students of the game. He won on the kicking game and defense. And uh, the general taught all of us who had the honor of playing for him certain things which we all used in our coaching and many people today have been influenced by General Nayland, people you wouldn't even think about, people like Red Sanders, the old Vanderbilt coach, uh, Frank Broyles out of Arkansas who got his information from me, who got his coaching, Darrell Royal at Texas who really was using Nayland's theories because it came through me to Darrell. So the General had an influence on all of us and he was great. They may have received their coaching philosophy from Nealon, but that does not necessarily mean they got to know him well. Nealon wasn't all that friendly with a lot of the players, but he kind of stayed aloft. That's the way it was with him. He kept arm's length from all the kids. But that doesn't mean that he didn't care about his players. They always knew that he would be there if a problem was at hand. I would uh, characterize him as my second father. <laughs> he was that good to me. And he, he liked if you gave him an effort, he'd ask me more than that. But he asked him 110% on this. And he got it. Most of he did, he didn't stay around long. More than anything else, Nealon succeeded because he was progressive. He does not seem to be a daredevil type, and he wasn't. But unlike many successful people, he would try a new approach. You know, people say, well, he couldn't coach today because he was old fashioned. She'd still be the best coach like he was then because he understood football and what it took to win. So Nealon brought his football know-how, his organization, his teaching ability, and his innovation into his first head coaching job and inherited a program that was not full of talent. So he knew that he would have to drive them, installing his powerful single wing and a 6-2-2-1 defense. 
playing a light schedule. Tennessee went 8-1 in 1926, losing decisively to Vanderbilt. McNeilan had laid a groundwork with that first unit, plus had established a network of contacts that produced a great recruiting class. The captain had his eye on Bristol tailback Gene McEver, and almost like he was making out a wish list, Neyland landed him and other talented players. In 1927, Tennessee went 8-0-1, this time earning a tie with Vanderbilt, which gave UT the Southern Conference title. Neyland's plan was working. His system was in place. He had won with it, and now he had some players. The first group of Flamin' Sophomores was ready for 1928. McEver was the tailback, weighing a sturdy 190 pounds. The former Virginia High star was a player that Nealon dearly loved. I don't think McEver himself knew how he ran, except that he got there. Well, I'll tell you how tough he was. I never saw him hit when he didn't come up smiling. And as he lay there on the ground, whether well, it was in the mud on an ordinary field, he had that grin on his face. Nobody, to my recollection, ever knocked it off of him. He was a tough guy. Neyland told me more than once that McEver was the best football player he ever had. Buddy Hackman, Quinn Decker, and Kingsport native Bobby Dodd rounded out the backfield. Add Hobo Thayer, Hugh Faust, and Fritz Brandt, and you've got a powerful team. Neyland knew what he had and decided to step up the schedule, adding the power of the South, Alabama. It was a gamble. Since his team would travel to Tuscaloosa as a decided underdog, the story goes that Neyland played a little psychological warfare on Alabama's head coach, Wallace Wade. Neyland went to Wade before the contest and insisted that he had the inferior 11 and asked Wade if the final two quarters could be shortened if the game itself got out of hand. Wade was apparently shocked by the request, but he agreed. He probably was more shocked after the opening kickoff. McEver caught that ball on the two-yard line, and according to my recollection, and it would take a moving picture to convince me the contrary, he ran right down the middle of that field, 98 yards for a touchdown. Tennessee never trailed, winning the confrontation 15 to 13. And from that day forward, the Volunteers would never be able to sneak up on an opponent again. Well, I suppose the Alabama game, 28, stands out the most. Not that that was the greatest game, but that was the game that put Tennessee on the map. And naturally, that would, would make, it, make it stand out. But a lot of games, better games than that one, I thought. Especially when you win a big one, that gives you the confidence which you always need. And I expect that was a stepping stone. Along with that victory, Neyland got his first win over Vandy. And it was marred only in part by a tie with Kentucky as UT finished at 9-0-1. Tennessee matched that record in 1929, again beating Alabama, and to the chagrin of the Vol faithful, tying Kentucky. McEver was named as Tennessee's first All-American, scoring what is still a school record 130 points. It was during October of this season that the stock market came crashing down and the depression was to begin. Ball fans understood the hopelessness and insecurity that all Americans did. It even carried over to their entertainment. During the summer, McEver was lost for the year during a baseball game. His knee was ripped to shreds. UT won nine for the third straight year, but fell decisively to Alabama 18-6 the Volunteers' first loss since 1926. The Flamin' Sops went 27-1-2 in their three campaigns, and reinforcements were on the way for 1931. The leader of this group would ironically come from Bristol's Virginia High, the same school that sent McEver to UT four years earlier. He was a full-blooded Indian named Beatty Feathers. Feathers was a do-it-all type, who some ball historians claim had no equal. He ran with the speed of a tailback and the, the strength of the fullback. And he would just absolutely run over people. You know. uh, he didn't wait you know, to set up the blocker. He just, he, you know, if the blocker's got in the way, he'd run over them too. To Feathers, that title should go to his idol. 
McEver, who would be back for 1931, complete with a knee brace that would undoubtedly hinder his play. Feathers would take over the role of star as the Volunteers galloped to a 9-0-1 record. Again, the blot was a tie with Kentucky and a standoff that kept Tennessee from a Rose Bowl appearance. But UT was asked by New York Mayor Jimmy Walker to play in a charity game in the Big Apple, which would benefit those hurt by the Depression. The volunteer team drew New York University and won the lackluster December contest 13 to nothing. 1932 saw another 9-0-1 finish, but featured two classic games. The Vols beat Alabama for the fourth time in five years as Tennessee won a punting duel between Feathers and Johnny Hurry Kane, 7-3. The second of those two games was a 0-0 tie with Vanderbilt. Dudley Field was a mob scene with over 30,000 fans in attendance. UT won the final Southern Conference title for their efforts as 13 schools would disembark to form the Southeastern Conference. The Volunteers' first two campaigns in that league were less than awe-inspiring by the standards of all fans, as Tennessee went 7-3 in Feathers' final year and 8-2 in 1934. After the 34 season, the Army called on Neyland, and the captain was forced to go to Panama. Neyland was reluctant to leave, and he had opportunities before and after this, but Neyland remained due to the fact that he simply loved the area. But this was the Army, and Neyland couldn't say no to Uncle Sam. So to Panama he went, and Bill Britton was promoted to take over for a man who went 76, 7, and 5 in the previous nine campaigns. Britton was a competent football man who inherited a team that wasn't full of talent. Tennessee's 4-5 record bore out that fact. This type of year no longer suited UT fans who hadn't experienced a losing year in 11 seasons. Fortunately, Panama hadn't suited Neelan and his family, and the newly dubbed major got his orders changed. They read Knoxville, Tennessee, and he was back in charge of the Tennessee program when the 1936 season rolled around. He surveyed the scene, and he knew it would take time to rebuild Tennessee into a football power. His first two years back at the helm, Neelan saw his charges win six games. Nothing special by his standards, but certainly not bad. During the 1937 season, the Major had found a leader. He was a Hungarian from West Virginia, a competitor named George Cafago. Cafago's story about getting to UT is one that makes you appreciate the times. He brought me down here without ever seeing me play football. He was set up in the little stands up there in West Virginia watching me practice baseball for about two hours. He asked me then, asked me if I'd like to go to school, and I told him I certainly would, but I couldn't go to school because I didn't have any money, but didn't have any parents or anything. I was just here, stayed here and there and everything. He says, well, you tell you what, you want to come to Tennessee, I'll take care of everything. You don't have to worry about anything. Boy, and that really made me happy. So I thought of him like a daddy. Cavago teamed up with Babe Wood to give UT a strong one-two punch in the backfield. By 1938, Cavago and a talented group of sophomores formed a team that was unstoppable, going 11-0 to become the only Vol 11 ever to win each contest which it played. The pivotal game was not Alabama, but Auburn. The Tigers were unbeaten, facing the Vols in the season's third game, and UT was an underdog. The 7-0 victory propelled the Volunteers past Alabama the following week, 13-0 to Birmingham, and by the next six opponents by a combined score of 210-6. to That left Tennessee with its first major bowl bid, the opportunity to play in the Orange Bowl on New Year's Day, 1939. The opponent, the powerful Sooners of Oklahoma. It was a brutal game with broken bones and fights commonplace in the 60-minute struggle. It may be a cliche, but Tennessee's 17 to nothing victory was hard fought. About five Oklahoma boys were thrown out of the game and four Tennessee. But you know, when you get hit, you hit back like they throw both out anyway. <laughs> General Nalen sent Joe Little, who was an alternate captain, and to uh, quieten the boys down. And <clears throat> back then they had a uh, substitution rule that the sub couldn't come in and talk to the player until they run one play. Unless he was the quarterback, he could just call the play. So Joe was center, and uh, of course he lined up over the ball, snapped it, and fell on it, hit him right in the mouth, and Joe was captain of the boxing team. 
So he, he stood up and knocked him all the way through the umpire. <laughs> they threw him out of the game. He never did even get his message in. <laughs> the Vols carried a five-game streak of holding its opponents scoreless in the 1939, but they would take a scoreless streak to new heights in that season. Before we talk about that year, Vol fans must understand just who was anchoring the UT defense. His name was Bob Suffrage. You may know him better for his feat of blocking three Sammy Baugh punts in one game while playing for the NFL's Philadelphia Eagles. But before he went on to the pros, Suffrage was a star at Tennessee. The Knoxville native was a free spirit who didn't exactly follow prescribed football technique. Well, it had well more than a belt than I've ever seen in a lineman. He, he just, he'd do that hand shiver and jar your teeth. I think we were playing Alabama in 1939 and we weren't doing very good and Seth wasn't doing very good at all. And Malin got out his clipping, stuck him on the board and said, Seth, I want you to take these back out to half and show these Alabama linemen who you really are. And of course, we turned around and beat them. He was a hell of a football player, one of the best, quickest guards I ever saw. The guard won All-American honors in 1938, joining Cafago and an end named Bowden Wyatt in doing that. 1939 would be another All-American campaign for Suff and Cafago, but it was the team who actually got more notoriety in this case. Abe Shires and Ed Malinsky joined Suffrage and Cafago in the All-American squads and as anchors of a ball defense that wouldn't give up a point, not one. The 39 team also handed Alabama as thorough of a beating as it has ever received. The final was 21 to nothing, but it was complete dominance. The contest is best known for a single run. Johnny Butler's 56-yard scamper is called by some as the greatest run in Tennessee football history. I remember that one very well because uh, it probably was the most exciting run I ever saw. I was reading a book just the other night, Bill Stearns, autobiography, and Bill Stearns said of all the games he ever broadcast, Butler's run of 56 yards was the most exciting football run he ever did. The 1939 Vols were rewarded for their second straight 10-0 season with a Rose Bowl bid to face the mighty Southern Cal Trojans. Some would say UT was beaten in this game by the Citadel or the elements in the Citadel game. For it was in this contest that Cafago had been seriously injured. Well, when I planted my foot, I got down that real soft turf, real deep. And then I turned, my knee turned, but my ankles didn't. And it just and I fell, and then the guard pulled and fell over top of me. So Tennessee would have to face the Rose Bowl without the services of Cafago and Bob Suffrage, who was also banged up. Butler and star wingback Bob Fox would have to take up their slack. But even though the Vols would be shorthanded for the contest, this couldn't spoil the thrill of a trip to Pasadena. Fondest memory is getting there because I hitchhiked, as a matter of fact. And uh, we were up here on the corner, Ellis and Annie's drugstore, and a guy stuck his head in the door, and he was a bricklayer from Sevierville, and his parents lived in uh, California, and he had bought a new car and was driving home, and he said, anybody want to go to California? 
Well, Billy King and Bob Broom and I said, yeah. And we got in the car and away we went to California. The team went at a little more luxurious surroundings, but that wouldn't mean the three-day trip was all play and no work. The train trip was fine. It was a special train set up by the Southern Pacific, and it had uh, a good, uh, a selected crew to take care, and it was just like a, just like a world tour, cruise. We had two diners. Of course, they were all Pullman, Pullman uh, train, uh, cars, baggage cars, to take care of that. And there was a stenographer and a barber aboard. And the food was delicious. We, we practiced on the way out a couple of times. First, down at the Bob Neelan's birthplace. But it was raining and we went on to uh, El Paso. It was, it was a normal something. They'd stop and they'd exercise at certain points. And it was a nice trip. Upon arrival, Knoxville native Clarence Brown saw to it that the UT party had a good time. The famed MGM director held a Christmas Day party which featured star after star, including the sex symbol of the day, Lana Turner. After the game, however, Brown felt somewhat guilty. Later, why, he made the confession that he probably lost the ball game, that they did too much, <laughs> they showed off too much, it, but that, that had no effect on him. Tennessee fell 14 to nothing to USC, seeing their winning streak snapped at 23 games, and their scoreless streak ended at 15 contests. But still, the Vols' appearance in the Pasadena Classic had given UT national respect, not often accorded to Southern football teams. So after consecutive SEC titles and number two finishes in the nation, the Vols looked again to win it all in 1940. But apparently the pollsters weren't impressed with Tennessee. After all, two teams scored on them, and one of the 10 vanquished opponents got within 13 points of the Southeastern Conference champion. 10-0 was getting to be a way of life, and so were New Year's Day bowl appearances. This time it was the Sugar Bowl, facing Frank Leahy's Boston College Golden Eagles. Tennessee suffered a 19-13 loss that irked Neyland to no end. Well, yeah, it did bug him to no end, there's no question about that. And the game itself, uh, Tennessee took the opening kickoff and drove right down the field, easily as you can imagine, and scored. And it just looked like it was going to be one of those days. Didn't turn out that way, and uh, actually, uh, Charlie O'Rourke uh, ran back the uh, a winning touchdown on a play that was taken from Neyland's book. Bill Cunningham had come down uh, from the Boston newspaper, and Bill was a former All-American, and he had scouted the practices, had picked up the fake pass and run, and put it in the Boston attack, and they scored and won it. So the Vols finished 1940 ranked number four in the nation, and things were about to change again. Right before the season, Germany had invaded Russia, and President Roosevelt changed his isolationist policy, enacting the first peacetime draft in our nation's history. One of the best men to train the two million new soldiers, Major Robert Neelan, and he was called away to do his duty again. His leave, unlike 1935, was not expected to be permanent. So when John Barnhill was handed the reins, he knew that it wasn't forever. But the former ball player had the team ready for 1941. Johnny Butler was a senior and sparked the volunteers to an eight and two mark. Not great, but better than expected. Eight days after the final game of 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and the United States was into World War II, like it or not. Football was scaled down in 1942 with the loss of many able bodies. But Tennessee had a great year, winning nine games and the Sugar Bowl over Tulsa. There was no college football in 43, and volunteers Rudy Clarer, Clyde Fuson, Bill Noling, and Willis Tucker gave perspective to the layoff. These balls gave their lives in defense of the flag. As a means of pumping up stateside morale, college football came back in 1944 
competitive spirit hadn't waned at home, and Barnhill's team showed it. As his 44 edition went 7-1-1, one one, tying Alabama and losing only to USC in the Rose Bowl. UT lost only once in 45, while winning eight. So as the war in the Pacific was ending, Barnhill's successful tenure as Tennessee coach was coming to an end. His 32 wins in four strife-torn seasons hadn't gone unnoticed. As the newly dubbed General Robert Nealon returned, Barney departed to become head coach at Arkansas. So Nealon looked on as players began to trickle back in, and he had a challenge simply with who was coming back. Players ranged in age from the normal 17 and 18 of a freshman to 26 of those returning vets. The task of giving orders to a man who had seen the horrible sights of war was one that would trouble the disciplined, conscious Neela. In 46, he had no problem with it, going 9-2 with an Orange Bowl loss to Rice thrown in. He proved that he still had the touch in the opener that year, as the general had Walter Slater take a safety to drop Bobby Dodd's Georgia Tech team 13-9. Dodd learned a valuable lesson that day. An upset loss at the hands of Wake Forest couldn't mar what would happen the next week. Slater faked out the great choo-choo justice on his way to the game-winning score with a 20-14 triumph over North Carolina. So Nealon had picked up where he left off, but 47 and 48 would raise questions. Those two campaigns produced only 500 records, and old-timers say that the general's inability to communicate with the older players was the big reason. Oh, I think that it's partially valid because I think some of those things are true. However, no matter how much combat a man had been in, how long he'd been in the Army, I don't think he ever lost that little respect and fear for Nealon. About the only good thing to come out of those years was the completion of the South End Horseshoe of Neyland Stadium. The move raised seating capacity to 46,390, an increase of 15,000 seats, which is the biggest one-time increase in the history of the stadium. It was all in Neyland's master plan for expanding the stadium to the level which it is today. He had a master plan at Rust Engineering Company in Birmingham, Alabama to complete that stadium as well as before we ever built the UT hospital out on the Alcoa Highway, he wanted to construct a 20,000 seat basketball arena, which they turned down. That's why he had nothing to do with Stokely Center. 1949 brought the Vols back to winning ways as another group of talented underclassmen ushered in two platoon football with a 7-2-1 record. Previously, the 11 players on the field had played both offense and defense, but now there would be a unit for each, meaning Neyland's great recruiting class of 1948 was all the more important. The general was oriented basically offense and defense. He segregated you out and put you on to defense or offense. I think the general was very oriented to the two platoon. I think he enjoyed it. Jack Stroud and Bud Sherrod were talented holdovers who would play both ways. But they were joined by great athletes like tailback Herky Payne and Hank Loricella, fullback Andy Kozar, wingback Burt Retchishar, tackles Doug Atkins and Bill Perriman, and guard John Michaels. You get the idea. The 1950 team had talent, and lots of it. After opening the year with a blowout of Southern Mississippi, another Mississippi school, Mississippi State, reached up and bit the ball 7-0 an upset that still puzzles members of that team. Well, it, uh, as I recall, uh, Mississippi State was better mentally prepared for the game that day. They really came out with a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, they were playing before their hometown folks. Um, Tennessee was highly rated that year. We were rated number three in the nation starting off. Um, we took the game, I think, a little too easy uh, and obviously uh, did not play near to our potential. Tennessee got its act together and won the next 10 games, including a huge triumph over highly touted Kentucky and a young coach named Paul Bear Bryant. The Vols took special pride in this one, shutting out the Wildcats and their All-American quarterback, Babe Pirelli, by a score of seven to nothing. 
Again, Bryant failed in his bid to beat Neyland, and he never did top the general. That particular game, Kentucky had the best football team they ever had in the history of, of Kentucky. And they came to Knoxville with the intention of just knocking us off. And I think Neyland used uh, psychology like he's never used psychology before. The week before that ball game, I remember, we, we did very little hitting. We did very little anything except playing around. We, play, we actually played games, and we didn't dress out or, uh, in pads, in full pads, like Monday or Tuesday. He had a way of, of, of sort of, of getting us hungry to hit. And, of course, we had little, a little idea that it was going to snow like it did. You know, it, it, we, had, we had quite a bit of snow. And, uh, and, and so forth, but, but he sort of eased off on us that particular week, and we got together mentally for the ball game. Our coaches, you know, they put together tremendous defense for that game, and our defense played. The 1950 season ended with a trip to the Cotton Bowl to face homestanding Texas. Neelan, the native Texan, saw his underdog volunteers score first. Fourth down coming up, and this one tells the tale. Payne once again watches that line move in close to the center in the ship. Calls for that ball. He delays momentarily, then hits to this side. Has that arm caught. Lots of pass into the end zone. Trumbo has it for a Tennessee touchdown. The highlight of the drive was a 75-yard run by Boricella that certainly challenges Butler's 1939 Alabama gallop for greatness in Tennessee history. Single wing to the right. Tennessee volunteers have got their offensive line up back. He's not going to give it to every time. Hank Boricello in the tailback. He's going up. That is all right. He's up to 25 to 30. We uh, started the play to the outside, but moved to the inside, as I recall, and it was a really great, uh, typical Tennessee play. I should have ran straight down the field for 80 yards and for a touchdown. However, after going through the line, I tried anxiously to start running as fast as I could. Well, what happened, I started losing my footing and started slightly stumbling, almost got to the goal line. That was the greatest run I have seen this year and one of the greatest I have ever seen in my life. Hank Lorenzello, 85 yards on a twisting, spinning run that you're going to have to see in the newsreel to believe. The general was very, very proud of, of a picture that was taken by a Texas newspaper depicting this play in its early part where the play was, I was still behind the line of scrimmage, but you can see virtually every Texas man either blocked or about to be blocked. Texas rallied to take a 14-7 lead. But two fourth period touchdowns by Kosar gave UT a 20-14 win over UT. That's Tennessee over Texas. This was one of the all-time great games in ball football history without a doubt. The lead changed hands at least five times, as I recall. Uh, it was a hard-fought football game. We were, we were ranked, I think, number four or three in the nation, and Texas was rated just a notch above us. So uh, it, was a, it was a good match, and uh, it was a good hard football game. I was the one who missed the extra point <laughs> down there, and we, that would have made us tied. I mean, I guess late in the fourth quarter, I missed, it made us 14-13. And I remember Neilan told me when I came off, I was, I was a sophomore, and he said, we didn't come down here, son, to tie. On the strength of the Cotton Bowl triumph and the players that returned, Tennessee was the nation's preseason number one team, and the Vols lived up to the bill.
Tennessee trounced nine opponents before coming to the Vanderbilt game and nearly blowing the year. After leading 28 to nothing, we did get complacent. We did go on to win 35 to 27, but uh, we, we, it could have been a turning point for us. With the victory, Tennessee was named as the national champion as the polls in those days were done before the bowl games. Good thing for the balls, as in their Sugar Bowl date with Maryland, the brother combination of Ed and Dick Moduleski teamed up to rip up UT. The final was not as close as the score may indicate, as the Terps scored a 28-13 win. In reviewing 1950 and 51, which saw Tennessee go 21-2, appear in two major bowls, win an SEC title, and of course take a national championship, the players from that era agree. The 1950 team was the better of the two. The 50 team was really a little better than the 51 team, the team that won the Cotton Bowl. Uh, I think, you know, we lost some awfully good players, Jack Stroud, uh, Bud Sherrod, Looney Smith, people like that, and we were, uh, I think, a little better team in 50. Facing the 1952 season, the general appeared to have real problems. The runner-up in the previous year's Heisman Trophy balloting, Laura Sella, was gone, and so was the team's leading scorer. Payne, Perriman, Daffer, and Rechishar had graduated as well. But tailback Jimmy Wade stepped forward, and seniors Jim Haslam, Kosar, and Michaels, and Atkins provided leadership as UT cruised to a surprising 8-1-1 record. Included in that year was a 20-0 thumping of Alabama that saw Wade and Kosar shine. Another Cotton Bowl bid followed, and it was a rematch of the game of two years before as Texas was lined up as the foe. But during preparations, the news hit like a bombshell. General Nealon was sick, and his doctors would not let him coach. The players were stunned, but didn't realize that Nealon had coached his last game at Tennessee. I did not realize how, uh, you know, how uh, ill he might be or what his uh, chances of coaching the team were. None of us, I don't think, ever believed that he was through with coaching as it happened to, uh, to the turn it took. Texas 16 to nothing triumph was almost secondary as the Harvey Robinson led balls were overmatched and even listless without their leader. Shortly after the New Year's Day contest, it became official. The general was leaving coaching to become full-time athletic director, and Robinson would be the ball's new coach. And looking at Nealon's record, the stats don't lie. A 173, 31, and 12 record. Seven conference titles. Seven major bowl appearances. No losing seasons in 21 years. A 72, 19, and 6 Southeastern Conference record. A 12, 5, and 2 record against Alabama. 22 All-Americans, 31 All-SEC performers. But more than that, General Robert Nealon had elevated Tennessee football to Southern prominence and then to national stature. There would be no reprieve this time. The General was retired for good, and the former Vol quarterback Harvey Robinson would be working in the shadow of a legend. I thought he's going to have problems because I think anybody does with like Neil and Brian people you just don't you know so I think somebody has to sort of sacrifice to go in between the next coach. The Vols stumbled through the two years under Robinson inconsistency really being the mark of his tenure. In the final game of 1954 Robbie's fate was sealed as Tennessee was crushed by Vanderbilt 26 to nothing. General Nealon swallowed hard and did the only thing that he felt that he could, make a change. Robinson and his entire staff were let go, and the choice to replace him was an obvious one. There were several UT grads in top coaching positions, but in the minds of Vol fans and the athletics board, there was only one choice. 38-year-old Bowden Wyatt, the former Vol All-American in. Wyatt captain what General Nealon always referred to as his favorite team, the 1938 Volunteers. This Roan County native was the perfect Nealon player. 
disciplined, hardworking, tough, and most of all, a team player. When he concluded his playing career, Wyatt had a job offer, and as you probably noticed by now, Bowden was a remarkably handsome man and the motion picture industry beckoned. But he had no interest in that or his looks. Bowden Wyatt wanted to be a football coach, plain and simple. He got his first opportunity to run a program at Wyoming and took the Cowboys to new heights in the old Big Sky Conference. Next, it was on to Arkansas. And in 1954, only his second year in Fayetteville, the Razorbacks were the elite team of the Southwest Conference. Now Tennessee needed a coach, and Wyatt wanted the job, and so did members of his staff, even if they didn't realize it right off. Bowden called me in and said, uh, where'd you rather coach, go coach, than anywhere in the United States? I said, well, I think Texas. And he was shocked to, for me to say that, because I didn't know anything about Harvey and the happenings here. And he said, what about Tennessee? I said, oh, hell yeah. The formalities and secrecy over with, Bowden Wyatt was coming back to the job that he had always wanted. He was returning to Knoxville as the Volunteers' 15th head coach. Immediately upon his arrival, he made an impression on his players that would last a lifetime. When he came into Tennessee football, it was awful impressive, the, the manner in which he conducted himself and his leadership and his uh, commanding uh, personal appearance. You know, he was just an uh, overwhelming individual uh, in appearance and his conduct and his methods. and. And after being in uh, coaching for a number of years, I, as I look back on it, I still feel the same way about it. Robinson had not left the cupboard bare for Wyatt. Charlie Coffey returned at guard. John Gordy was a talented tackle. And Tommy Bronson was a promising young fullback. But one of the few bright spots on Robinson's final team was a young tailback named Johnny Majors. Majors had arrived at UT from Huntland High in southern middle Tennessee in 1953 fresh from a star-studded prep career. Weighing 155 pounds soaking wet, Majors was small but could do all the things that a single wing tailback had to do and could do them with almost equal skill. He combined skill with a football mind, one that came from his father, Shirley Majors, who just happened to be his high school coach. I remember this vividly, he say, look, you don't have to play to please me. But see, if you're gonna play, you're gonna give it your best. I think it's one of the greatest things my dad gave us and also anybody ever played for him. He was very demanding. If you didn't hustle, you had a tough time with him. If you hustled, he could coach the heck out of you and make you a good player. His leadership ability was another key for Wyatt and the style of player and coach meshed immaculately. Well, enough in fact that Wyatt's first group of volunteers shocked fans with a 6-3-1 mark. 1955 may have given the team needed confidence but they couldn't have known what the following season would bring. One by one, the opposition fell to the 56 balls. Auburn, then Duke, Chattanooga, Alabama, Maryland, North Carolina, and then Georgia Tech. But Tech wasn't supposed to fall. To Tennessee, or anyone else for that matter, the unbeaten Yellow Jackets had what Bobby Dodd was to later state was his finest team. In the first half, Tech was on the offensive driving into Tennessee territory on more than one occasion. But an opportunistic Vol defense held their ground, and Sterling punting from Majors and his backup, Bobby Gordon, kept the game scoreless at the intermission. The second half didn't see Tennessee get that many scoring opportunities, but they got one and cashed in. Still no score in the game. First down and 10 for the Volunteers in the Tech 46-yard line. Majors a tailback, takes the handoff to the fullback, passes down on the right side, Buddy Cruz, a good catch between two tech defenders. He's across the 20 to the 15, good block down to the 10, the 5, and he's brought down on the one-yard line, and a tackle from behind by Ken Owens. Mitchell made an attempt to break up the pass and couldn't make up his mind whether he wanted to get to the ball or tackle me, and didn't do either one of them, and just went by me and made the best block on the field. And offside halfback guy named Rotenberry. There's nothing there but 40 yards of open field to run in. And I tried to be a great running back, you know, and cut back. If I had not, I could have scored, but the offside linebacker caught me from behind. Bronson finished it off, and that was the ball game. 
Tennessee 6, Georgia Tech nothing. This was a classic uh, demonstration of field position, good defense, uh, the kicking game. Tennessee finished the year 10-0, SEC champs for the first time in five years. The Vols earned the right to face Baylor in the Sugar Bowl. Elvis Presley may have been the best known Tennessee in 1956, but Johnny Majors wasn't far behind, finishing second to Notre Dame's Paul Horning in a controversially close Heisman balloting. Ball fans point out that Horning played on a team that won only two games. Well, Horning and I have kidded each other a lot of times about that. Notre Dame's always had a stronger voting power than most of us. I look back and I had no idea I would win it. I thought I'd be in strong contention, but I didn't get myself built up. Like, you know, you live in your hopes, not your fears, but you also got, you also hope for the best and expect the worst, and therefore you're never completely down too much in my opinion. And I never was badly disappointed about that. Yeah, I was disappointed, but I never felt like it. I got the shaft, if you may use that word. I, I don't feel that way about playing football. I, I felt like I had a lot of good things go my way. And I thought I was in a very select group with some darn good football players, and I've never let myself uh, get too far thinking about that in a negative way too much. Now there was a sugar bowl to be won, and the miracle balls couldn't pull it off. For Majors, it was a low point. He fumbled a punt late in the contest, and it proved the difference as Baylor won 13 to 7. But January 1st, 1957, reinforced something to these UT players. Football was just a game. I think it's a 7-7. Seven, seven. And we're driving, driving for apparently what would, we thought would possibly have been a touchdown in the, in the Baylor territory. And Bruce Burnham was kicked in the head in the infamous play, or Larry Hickman kicked in the, in the head. And we thought he was dying on the practice on the football field. He went into convulsions. And, uh, so from all indications, the last rights were given to him on the sideline. And Bruce was a classmate of, uh, of ours, of seniors, and an outstanding guard. And they stopped the game for, I don't know, seemed like 15 minutes at the time, I'm sure at least 10, eternal time. We didn't score, but who knows, we might not have scored anyway. I was very disappointed that we lost. And she, Mother tells a story, the first thing I said, and I came out of the locker room, uh, I said, Mother, Bruce is going to be okay. Uh, I was hurt about losing the ball game. I was hurt about making a fumble, I can tell you that. But uh, the biggest uh, relief I had at the end of the game that Bruce Burnham was not going to be, was not dead and dying. He was going to be alive and he'd gotten a good report at the hospital. Maybe 1957 hadn't started off so well for Tennessee, but the remainder of it went pretty well. Wyatt posted his third winning season in as many tries at UT, seeing his volunteers go eight and three. This Sammy Burklow field goal provided the game's only points in a 3-0 Gator Bowl victory over Bear Bryant at Texas A&M. Unfortunately, things would never be this good again for Wyatt. I think that uh, when Coach Dick hit, uh, who had been with Coach Wyatt for years and was his confidant and his assistant head coach and was just a stabilizing force on the staff, decided to retire from coaching. I think that that really hurt him. And uh, of course, Tennessee was still running the single wing, and most high school teams had gone to the tee, and then I, I think that, that hurt Coach Wyatt too. 1958 was a disastrous year. Auburn held the vault single wing offense to negative yardage on national television in an embarrassing loss. That set the tempo for a 4-6 campaign that saw Chattanooga actually get a win over UT, setting off a riot among mock fans in attendance at Shields Watkins Field. There was everything going on. You'd had, you had some people trying to tear down the goalpost, other people trying to keep them from tearing it down. You had, had fights going on everywhere. Other people were celebrating and walking right among where all the fights were going on. They had to arm around each other with a bottle of whatever. And then they brought the fire trucks in. We're going to wet everyone down. And while they were trying to wet everyone down, they had some people up above with their pocket knives out sawing on the hose to cut the hose to the fire truck. Oh, it was, it was, a, it was a mess. Tennessee fans were now calling for Wyatt to dump the single wing and to go to the formation of the day, the standard T. But Wyatt wasn't changing. And for the first seven Saturdays of 59, he looked correct. The Vols approached their November 7th home date with LSU at 4-1-1, one one, 
but weren't supposed to be able to match up with the Tigers, who just happened to be undefeated, the defending national champions, and the nation's number one team. Billy Cannon was the LSU tailback and had become a legend on his way to the Heisman Trophy. Cannon had the Tigers in front, 7-0, when Vol defensive back Jim Cartwright intercepted a pass and ran it back 59 yards to tie the score. LSU turned it over on the next play, and moments later, fullback Neil Soley bounded into the end zone. Just like that, Tennessee led 14-7. But it certainly wasn't over. The Tigers came right back to score and cut the UT lead to a single point. Their coach, Paul Dietzel, had a decision to make. Coach Paul Dietzel elects to go for the two-point conversion. The wing is to the right side. Billy Cannon's the man to watch. The third, the quarterback takes the ball, hands it to Cannon. Cannon on the right side. A hole starts to open. Schaefer trips him. Wing grub Charlie Severance and Bill Major trying to get the stop him in the one-inch line. Tennessee still leads 14 to 13. The late Bill Majors and Wayne Grubb are generally credited with assisting Knoxville native Charlie Severance in stopping Cannon on the two-point play. Severance is remembered for that one play more than anything else. Yes, I was remembered, you know, for that play. Uh, I went back and looked at, at when, I, when I got the movie last year and they ran it through on the cassette. I never felt like that was the best game that I played at UT. So Tennessee had beaten the defending national champions, but found over the next three weeks that they couldn't beat Ole Miss, Kentucky, or Vanderbilt. The 5-4-1 finish left fans with a bad taste in their mouths. The poor performance in 1958 had shocked them, but the win over LSU had gotten their hopes up, only to have them dashed. The next two years were no more exciting, producing six wins in each. Tennessee hadn't been to a bowl in four years. The 1956 season seemed to be a distant memory. The talk about dropping the single wing had reached a fevered pitch. Bowden Wyatt had troubles. And then in the spring that followed the 1961 season, he suffered a huge loss. On March 28, 1962, General Robert Nealon died at the age of 70. He was Wyatt's mentor, his friend, and also his teacher. For Wyatt, it was more than the loss of a friend or relative. A part of him died with Bob Nealon. Times were changing, the 60s were upon us, and John Kennedy had proven that the new ideas of youth were popular enough to get him elected president. Martin Luther King Jr.'s civil rights movement had the South questioning its own morals. NASA said that going to the moon was no longer a possibility, it was just a matter of time. And Bowden Wyatt said in Knoxville, an icon of tradition in a time when traditions were going out the window. The pain of Nealon's passing would have to be put aside, for in these uncertain times, Wyatt would have to face the challenge of 1962 by himself. Hi, I'm Rick Russo. All of us here at News 8 Sports are proud to be part of this special tribute to 100 years of UT football. You know, UT football touches something very special in all of us. It captures the real spirit and pride that comes with being from Tennessee. Just as the Vols are part of the Valley, so is News 8 Sports and our commitment to covering UT sports. So join us for another exciting year of UT football action right here on the Valley's very own Channel 8 WKXT-TV, the Volunteer Station.